Great. Um, well, thanks to to, um, to Mercatus and everyone who worked hard to make this event happen for the, the invitation to be here. Um, thanks to the authors, one in absentia, the other present, for writing a fabulous and extremely interesting book. Um, it's a stipulated thanks because um, the book is so good that it's I struggle with finding things bad or critical to say about it, um, but I'm going to do my best. Okay. Um, so one caveat is that um, is that you know so, so full outing is that um, I'm not an economist. Um, I'm trained in political science and philosophy, um, so I am not well suited to critique the empirical literatures that were drawn upon. Um, I really can't analyze the critically critically analyze the validity of the selection of cases that they use to draw general principles and precepts like those from Singapore or Argentina. Um, uh, the the um, although given my comparatively limited knowledge on the subject, um, from what I do know, their focus on the badness or goodness of institutions and institutional actors seems to me to be correct. It's the correct target of locus and concern. We, we, we just heard, um, I feel somewhat validated in, 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 um, in the, you know, echoing the, the, the sentiment that was just expressed. So I want to, with all of this is, is to say that I want to limit my, um, I want to limit my, my comments um, to really two areas. The first is a very, very briefly situate the project in the current global justice scholarship in the literature and how it is. We heard a little bit from Lauren um, where he's coming from, and I'll sort of round that out a little bit. I'll spend a little bit more time on discussing the wrinkles I see in the very long chapter on war. Um, that is my area of expertise, which is the ethics of peace and war, peace and war, um, particularly humanitarian intervention, and its relationship to um, to the author's conception of the state. Um, but I want to begin by way of anecdote, I think, to to show what is the um, the power of the core central thesis of the book. So. Um, I read a good bit of the book and, and um, prepared my comments over Thanksgiving. I have a nine-year-old son. It allowed me to spend some time with him. And um, he has a pretty good sense of what my literary and scholarly tastes are. Usually when he asks me what I'm, what I'm you know, reading or writing about, it has to do with um, war, political violence, famine, you know, really kind of uplifting subjects that he's, he's really into. But he saw the title, right, and, um, and Justice at a Distance. So he asked me, what's the book about? And I, and I said, um, well, what do you think it's about? And he said, I think I have a good idea, but I can tell you what I would want it to be about, okay? And he said, um, I really would like it to be about superheroes that see objects in the air and they can bring justice at a distance. I said, okay, well, what it is about <laughs> is, is um, it's just to sit a distance is, <laughs> so you have a, another, a, a co-author for you next to, but he said that justice is primarily. Uh, we're made up, we're moved. <laughs> <laughs> I, knew I knew it would expand our entire technology. <laughs> <laughs> the second edition, so, um, but he says the sequel, so he says that, so I told him justice is primarily about leaving people alone, right? That's the key thesis in the, you know, page two. And he says to me, um, well, if, Justice is about leaving people alone, then it's really unjust that you have to do a book report on Thanksgiving. And um, not to make, to, and then, you know, I, and I tried to say, oh, well, it's voluntary, and, you know, he, he left. I, after that, it's like a parting shot, but not to make too much of the exchange, but I think it's demonstrative of the fact that the thesis resonates with common intuitions and principles, right? My son thought, well, you've sort of been, you know, when his teacher assigns him a, a book report and says, read this, Give it to me in three days, you know, and, and there's, it's, it's highly coercive, right? I mean, it's a child. So, um, but it resonated with him that he thought that it was sort of a bummer to be coerced, especially during Thanksgiving. And that, so in short, the principle of liberty is, as non-interference, I think, can be persuasive. And the authors have done a good job in, in, in showing that. So the general contribution of the book to the global justice literature um, is that I think that it adds a libertarian flavor to the vanilla ice cream of cosmopolitan scholarship. So as we heard from Lauren a moment, a few minutes ago, is that um, the focus on global justice is generally on um, positive assistance and massive redistributive schemes. And that's what, that's what the, 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 
core of the literature calls for. It, the author terms this as a regulatory focus, right? doubling down in institutions, laws, and coercive measures, you know, large-scale taxation, uh, redistribution. So in contrast to the regulatory emphasis, the authors focus on the efficacy of institutions and the role they play in respecting individuals' rights. And this dovetails with the precept noted on page two, which I mentioned a moment ago that my son really found resonating, which is about leaving other people alone, not interfering in them. And that's what cosmopolitan justice requires, is people have the freedom to pursue their personal projects. And to wit, this is a refreshing departure from the typical cosmopolitan approach. So I, I wrote my dissertation on a, a cosmopolitan approach to warfare ethics. And um, I wish this book was around then. It's a, it's a, a refreshing complement to, that, to, that, to the literature. Um, more specifically, I was heartened by the use of empirical social science literature. So um, I'm speaking to a room full of primarily economists. Um, and, and so you may or may not know that sort of the stock and trade of philosophers is often to um, try to elicit intuitions as part of the methodology, elic elicit intuitions um, often by appealing to very cartoonish thought experiments. Um, and then from the intuitions that are elicited from these outlandish thought experiments to draw general moral principles which are then taken as objective fact. Right? Um, this isn't the approach that was taken in this book. Okay, so those are all the nice things that I'm going to say and now I want to turn and put on my, the hat of a critical commentator. So I want to focus here on the question of, uh, on the topic of war. But first I want to unpack the book's conception and role of the state vis-a-vis -vis the relationship between citizen, compatriot, right, so co-citizens, and distant others. So in my view, it bears on the permissibility of humanitarian intervention. So the end goal here is that I want to talk about humanitarian intervention and we're going to take a little tour through the conception of the state and the individual as it's laid out at the beginning of the book. Okay, so the authors begin with a primacy, putting a primacy on personal value and projects, right? Uh, a defense of, the pers of, of personal value, things that are primarily of value to the individual. Personal value in turn underpins the author's defense of personal partiality, right? You can, because you, because you, can, you can prioritize personal value, that is that you're going to be partial to oneself. Right? We heard this, this, um, this quote from Adam Smith just a moment ago. You can be partial to your projects, commitments to one's family, friends, compatriots, right? But this is not sort of unbridled partiality. This is constrained by rights, you know, such as life, liberty, property, the pursuit of happiness, and a reciprocal respect for others' own partiality. So you leave people alone, let them do their thing, and they will do the same for you. Now this connects with the twin importance of the primacy of liberty, that is the conception of liberty as non-interference, right? I should be left alone to pursue my projects, and personal prerogative via personal valuation. I should be free to value my personal projects as I see fit. And so if I want to go home and play Nintendo and eat chips, I should be free to do so. If I want to pr pursue philosophy and have an interesting conversation like the one that's about to, to ensue, I should be free to do that as well. And I should be free to prioritize that project within reasonable constraints. Okay, now this is in part supported by appeal to Smith and Sidgwick's observations on associative, what philosophers call associative preferences. That's the individuals are partial to themselves and their close associates. Right? This is the, what we just heard from, from Smith and uh, from the quote from Smith, and that since each is master of her own personal valuations, then she has the prerogative to order her priorities accordingly. Okay? So this is justified. So in turn, so we have the beginning. We all have these personal projects that we're partial to. Yeah, no big surprise there. And it's justified by a rights theory of Lockean liberalism. Right? We find this on page 56. So despite or perhaps because of this moral sentimentalism, right, the fact that we have these deep attachments to our own projects and those that are close to us, we are motivated to prefer those close to us, but also to effectuate our duty of non-interference for compatriots and foreigners alike. Now the authors argue that this theory of rights is pre-political and universal. That means it's cosmopolitan. Right? It's, it's a nat effectively a natural right in this sort of Lockean sense. So what this does is it both delineates the limits of our duties for compatriots and foreigners. Beginning of the book talks about the guy who prefers to spend his $4 on a skim vanilla. Is it you that prefers the coffee, the $4 on the latte as the coffee drinker in the, 
I, my what deductive powers. Yeah. <laughs> I owe you four dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not it's not unjust to prefer the four dollar on the on the latte. You're not violating the rights of the poor. Okay, but it also is calling for reciprocation, right? Yours and other right to non-interference must be respected too. It's a two-way street. Okay, fine. But if the main principle of justice is to leave people alone, and we can prioritize our own projects and those of our associates, and if the rights are universal, how do we navigate the very great needs of those less fortunate, like those living under tyranny whose rights are being violated, who are being interfered with on a daily basis, so what do we do when their right not to be interfered with is violated? And that's the core question here, okay? So how do we tame the potential for cosmopolitan mission creep, right? This cosmopolitanism that is interfering in all of our lives. Put another way, how do we ensure that individuals can pursue their personal projects while respecting the cosmopolitan rights of distant others, but not owing onerous positive assistance, right? You should be free to buy your latte and not have to contribute that four dollars to the jar for UNICEF every day, okay? But so how do we, how do we have these sort of this, this tension, if we think it's a tension? So here, the authors make an interesting move, which is they rely on the fiduciary duty of the state to its citizens in drawing the distinction between a duty to interfere in domestic freedom deniers, and so if you're living in a state, then the police or the, or the government has a as a co-citizens have an obligate have a duty to interfere when you're interfered with right this is we talks about Kant and all this and so um, and there is a mere permission to do so when considering foreigners so we have a duty that is entailed in the domestic situation and it is a mere permission when when thinking about foreigners now we have a quote here on page 209 which says the reason for this is that the state owes a fiduciary duty to its citizens the state has an obligation to protect its own citizens against one another, but only a permission to protect strangers. It's not a duty, right? That's why you can drink your latte and spend your four bucks while, while not donating that money to those that are being interfered with in distant lands. Okay, so the criticism that I have is that this conclusion is made via fiat and not argument. Um, I'm sure you'll find it persuasive. I find the intuition persuasive. And to be fair, the authors do note previously published works where they address topics such as this one, but at risk of trotting out a likely familiar objection, which I'm going to do anyways, this libertarian view of the state is challenged. Um, for example, Alan Buchanan writes in his piece, The Internal Legitimacy of hum Humanitarian Intervention, he says that the view is afflicted by a deep incoherence, if not an outright inconsistency. It justifies the state as a coercive apparatus by appeal to the need to protect universal interests while at the same time limiting the right of the state to use its coercive power to the protection of a particular group of persons identified by the purely contingent characteristic of happening to be members of the same political society." End quote. So if the triumvirate of rights, that is life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness are universal, What's the moral basis for protecting only those who possess the contingent property of being members of the same political community? Now, I don't necessarily hold this view, the one that I just articulated, that it is an incoherent position, and the authors obviously reject it, but fully addressing such a critique, such a critique would have strengthened the chapter in my view. Now, let's assume, arguendo, that the state does have a fiduciary duty, and it is limited to said citizens, okay? Here's where I want to turn to the topic of just war, and particularly humanitarian intervention. I lost my, where am I in terms of time? Because I can sort of, good. I'm good, okay. <laughs> um, I could go on and on, but I'm not going to, you know, I want to get, okay. Um, I don't want to steal anyone's time. So on this subject, the authors state, five, five minutes, perfect. Um, and I'm quoting, a government has a fiduciary duty towards its subjects. Fair enough. This includes the obligation to respect human rights at home, but because morality is universal and all persons have rights, a good government also has an obligation to respect human rights abroad. Okay, so don't interfere in others, others' projects abroad. And from this, the authors derive, and I'm quoting, an obligation to not cooperate with tyranny. All right, I'm in agreement so far. Then they go on to 
To, then they go on to note that, quote, this purely negative obligation can be reinforced by adding a softer obligation to promote human rights globally, provided, of course, that this can be done at a reasonable cost. That the government can, in theory, tax citizens for such a purpose as to fulfill this soft obligation. I would, I'm you know, done quoting here. So, if such taxation is, le is legitimate, then a government could, in theory, tax for humanitarian intervention. According to the authors, there is no difference with respect to taxation between taxing for funds for your human rights court or for a humanitarian intervention. The two are the same. They said those are two analogous cases. So, consequently, the authors conclude, and I quote, sometimes taxing people for war is justified. I agree. And this includes sometimes humanitarian intervention, end quote. The question I have is, why? So if the state does have an obligation to protect its own citizens against one another, but only a permission to protect strangers, then where does the softer obligation to promote rights globally come from? Right? This moral permission to effectuate the soft obligation through coercive measure of taxation. Right? So where does the soft obligation come from if we have a limited state that only that's only duty is fiduciary responsibilities to its citizens, where does the softer obligation to say being taxed to, to provide for humanitarian wars, where does this extra sort of bit of coercion come into? And, it's, and I couldn't find it in the, in, the, in the chapter, so I was looking for it. Um, okay, um, so taxation for some, oh, all right, so, um, all right, so to sum up here in this point is that my view is that this tension between the fiduciary model of the state to act solely in citizens' interest, right, those are the author's words, and the cosmopolitan tenant of universality of rights come into tension. So it's one that the authors could have done a better, a better job at attempting to resolve if it is all resolvable. I don't know if it is. All right, so my last point is that taxation for some humanitarian interventions is permissible in the author's stated view, all right? Um, but what about asking citizens to fight humanitarian wars on behalf of distant others? All right, so I, my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law is in the Air Force, and he's had to go to Afghanistan a bunch, and I sort of was like, hey, how's Afghanistan? Not a great, you know, it's sort of like a conversation stopper. Like, how's he, you know? And, um, and she said, well, I'm sick of my husband having to go, uh, to go and build nations abroad when, um, you know, when it is not what he signed up for. Right? So that's the objection that, that is trying to be answered here. Okay? Um, it's an N of one, so, you know, but still. Um, so what about asking citizens to fight humanitarian wars on behalf of distance others? Uh, the authors restrict the state's permission to two categories of people. Uh, the first is volunteer soldiers right, that we have in the United States and mercenaries. Um, the mercenaries is, a, is an interesting one, but I, I, I was, when thinking about it, I ran out of time to, to get into it. So we're going to go with just volunteers, and this will be I've two more minutes. So the author, authors endorse the proposition that a volunteer member of the armed services could be required to fight a war of humanitarian intervention by asserting that the enlistee has contractually authorized the government to decide on the justice of the cause of particular wars and the contract between soldier and state cannot be read reasonably to circumscribe the scope of permissible wars to only wars of self-defense. Right? So there's this sort of hypothetical contract between soldier and the state, and uh, it cannot be reasonably read to be limited only to wars of self-defense. That's the argument here. My question when reading this was, well, why not? Right? Can we not imagine a state that limits itself to only its fiduciary role, right? not the kind of softer obligation, Right? So, uh, not the model of fiduciary duty plus softer obligation to promote human rights, especially when the stakes are so high as to asking people to fight, kill, become maimed, injured, and possibly die. So, could we not imagine a model of armed forces that says something like, join us, footnote, we will not engage in humanitarian intervention, right? It's only wars of self-defense. Um, I have a few more points, but I'm I think I'm going, to stop. I'm, going to, I'm going to stop there. All this to say is that um, I, in fact, am, um, I, it, I agree with the, auth with the author's contention that humanitarian wars and taxation for humanitarian wars um, could be justifiable, um, but I think it needed better support and consistency with the particular theory. Um, so, uh, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. But, uh, Thank you.